Good morning, and welcome to NASA headquarters. I'm NASA Press Secretary Jackie McGinnis, and thank you for joining us to announce who NASA will work with to develop a human landing system for the agency's Artemis V mission to the moon. NASA issued the solicitation for the lander, known as Appendix P, in September of 2022, as part of the ongoing development of advanced space exploration technologies, capabilities, and concepts. We're joined today by NASA Administrator Bill Nelson, Jim Free, Associate Administrator for the Exploration Systems Development Mission Directorate, Lisa Watson Morgan, Program Manager for NASA's Human Landing System, and we'll also hear from a company representative before answering your questions. But first, I'll hand it over to Administrator Nelson. Good morning, everybody. Just over two years ago, NASA announced that SpaceX would build the human landing system to deliver the first astronauts to the lunar surface. It's been a half century since we were there. We held a robust competition for the first landing. And SpaceX is making good progress. We have big goals for our Artemis program about a mission a year to the lunar surface for stays for our astronauts up to 30 days. And today's announcement is about maintaining that cadence. It's about maintaining our excellence as the world's top space program and to maintain that for generations to come. It's about maintaining collaboration with our industry partners who will enable generations of explorers and pioneers to live and work on other planets. So we're here today to make an exciting announcement about a second Lander Award. An additional different Lander will help ensure that we have the hardware necessary for a series of landings to carry out the science and technology development on the surface of the moon and that what we do on the surface of the moon is in preparation for us to go to Mars. I've said it before, we want more competition. We want two landers, and that's better, and it means that you have reliability, you have backups. It benefits NASA, it benefits the American people. These are public-private partnerships. It's the new way that we go to the moon. It helps NASA share the risk, the technical risk, and the financial risk, the cost, to enable, at the end of the day, mission success. This new lander will be built and operated according to NASA's sustaining lunar lander requirements, which, needless to say, when you put astronauts in that environment, those requirements are vigorous. Those capabilities include docking with Gateway, the many some call Lunar Space Station. It includes increased crew capacity. It includes transporting more cargo for science and exploration on the moon surface. And so today, we, NASA, announced that Blue Origin and partners Lockheed Martin, Draper, Boeing, Astrobotic, and Honeybee Robotics will build a human landing system to deliver NASA astronauts to the lunar surface. For the Artemis V mission, NASA's SLS rocket will launch four astronauts to lunar orbit 
aboard Orion. They'll transfer to the gateway before entering Blue Origin's Blue Moon lander for about a week-long trip to the South Pole. And there they will conduct science and exploration activities. Our partnership will only add to this golden age of human spaceflight. Our work with commercial and international partners is keeping people fixated on the stars. And if you doubt this international aspect, just look how we were received a month ago when we went uh, to Ottawa, Canada, Canada received uh, by the Canadian government uh, because the first foreign astronaut on Artemis II to the moon is a Canadian astronaut. They are eager to be our partner and that is true across the globe. The historic Artemis I test flight six months ago was a huge success. In Houston last month, we saw firsthand the progress that Axiom Space is making on the spacesuits, and those are the ones that our astronauts will wear on the moon. SpaceX is working hard on their Starship and lander, which will deliver the first woman and the next man to the surface. Uh, I've asked and I still ask Jim Free every day how we are doing on the schedule for Artemis II and he assures me that we are on track for the fall of 2024. And with today's announcement, we are making an additional investment in the infrastructure that will pave the way to land the first humans on Mars. It's an incredible moment in spaceflight history. It's been 61 years since President Kennedy's words reverberated through Rice Stadium and made their way into the history books. Now, we know the first part. Quote, we go to the moon in this decade and do other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. But he continued, because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept one we are unwilling to postpone and one in which we intend to win. Our shared ambitions now are no less lofty than when President Kennedy dared a generation of dreamers to journey to the moon. And so today in this golden era of exploration, the Artemis generation, NASA chooses to return to the moon together with our commercial partners, with our international partners. And together, our work will pave the way for astronauts to one day venture to Mars. That, Jackie. Thank you, Administrator. Before we go to our next speaker, I want to welcome some of our partners from Blue Origin to join us here in the auditorium. And next we'll hear from Jim Free. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a great honor to join you here this morning and, and welcome our uh, new teammate to this side of the Artemis program in Blue Origin and congratulate you on your, um, your uh, award. 
Um, as the administrator mentioned, uh, this lander is targeted for Artemis V, which is really the intersection of our, our test flight and our long-term plans. Um, but I'd like to kind of talk to you about the other missions and then talk a little bit more specific on five. So the administrator talked about Artemis I, an incredible, flawless mission. I think we've used a lot of uh, superlatives around it and all of them well-earned. And uh, the data that we have from that mission is informing our next one, which uh, the crew being here in D.C. the past two days, I've only heard the stories of them. I haven't seen them, but uh, the stories certainly have gotten around about an incredible crew that will fly in Artemis II test out our ECLIS systems, fly around the moon, and really give us that confidence to fly crews on every mission thereafter. Um, as the administrator also mentioned, Artemis III will have the SpaceX lander on it and the Axiom suits, uh, critical developments for us returning humans to the moon, where we'll have those humans to explore that history that is the South Pole, four and a half billion years of solar system history, uh, right there on the moon, and we use the crew's decision-making skills and dexterity to really get samples to bring back uh, for our science mission director and partners to, uh, uh, to use and explore further. And I always told Thomas Erbuchen, he opened that last sample last year of the uh, Apollo program, I think to challenge us to get back there sooner. So uh, the, the gauntlet has been laid down. <clears throat> on Artemis IV, that really critical test flight where we bring, bring on the exploration upper stage, our co-manifested payload capability where I have our international partner, uh, the uh, European Space Agency and, and JAXA with the IHAB module, uh, continuing to build our capability where we'll go to Gateway for the first time and use Gate, Gateway and the uh, SpaceX lander uh, built to the sustainable lander requirements to go down to the surface and, uh, and bring the crew safely back home. And then finally, Artemis V, uh, which we're talking about the lander for today, where we'll really get to that yearly cadence of missions. That's our goal, is to be at that yearly cadence with Artemis V. We'll take up the Esprit module in the co-manifested payload space um, with the crew. And uh, that's, again, provided by the European Space Agency, so our international partners continue to grow there. We'll have the crew transfer from Orion to Gateway and then into the Blue Origin lander and go down to the surface. This lander, much like the SpaceX second lander, will have those sustainable uh, lander requirements to allow our crews eventually to stay up to 30 days as we build up the infrastructure, um, which is all based on our Moon to Mars objectives long term. Our objectives we're trying to uh, prove out at the Moon to go on to Mars and around which we built our recently released architecture. So I'd like to take a minute just to thank the NASA team that worked on this procurement for the, the past year plus. Um, it, it's an incredible, daunting job. It's a lot of work. And uh, I'd like to personally thank the folks from across the agency, led by the folks uh, at Marshall, but folks across the agency that supported that. So I would like to thank our NASA team. With that, congratulations again to our Blue Origin partner that joins us on this side of the Artemis program. You know, for me, being part of the Artemis team is a great honor, but it comes with great responsibility. Um, I hope that you share that honor today, and I look forward to you sharing that responsibility in the future. With that, let me turn it back over to Jackie. Thanks, Jim. Now we'll hear from Lisa Watson-Morgan. So thank you, Jim, and thank you, Administrator Nelson. It really is just the culmination of, of so many months. It's so exciting to be here. So much work, you know, with all of our uh, cross-program um, entities with Orion and SLS and, and the ground system at KSC, Gateway, um, Suits, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here and to really see us take this next step. So today's announcement, it is an important and exciting next step for the Human Landing System Program. And now we will have two providers and providing that competition that the administrator talked about uh, earlier. It also helps us with an, a more diversified industrial base, and that will help us advance innovation in the future. And that's really part of the American dream. 
I'm grateful for the continued strong congressional and stakeholder support for the human landing system program. You know, it shows that they're with us, that we're all together as a nation as we approach our return to the moon. We are really excited today to be working with Blue Origin and all of their partners. Um, we definitely have confidence in them and their approach. They have a very exciting architecture with a reusable Blue Origin lander and a Lockheed Martin cis lunar transporter, as well as lots of other contributions from their other partners. With two lander Pathfinder test flights scheduled in the next few years, I really look forward to working with them on how all that testing is going to help contribute to the overall development and our mission success. And our teams will soon perform a kickoff where we get together, we get to dig in deeper to all the details and the plan, and that will, that will get us started on the execution of the Artemis V mission. And, and that's what we're all about. We're definitely about execution uh, and, and getting started. Now, I also want to say it's it, the, the lander system and the programs, Artemis, and all of, all of the efforts on Moon to Mars, what we are trying to do is build on the lessons of the past. And I do want to take a moment to say earlier this week um, at the Johnson Space Center, I was able to meet with Charlie Duke, uh, a former Apollo astronaut. And we heard from his lips what it is like, the, the hurdles we have to overcome, some of the things maybe we didn't think through, and how all that will affect our implementation. And I'm telling you, that was such a gift. And with that knowledge and the experience base that we gained from listening to him and to others, we're building a stronger future that will help us be successful on the South Pole and in our sustaining efforts. So uh, with that, I just want to say thank you, and I'm really excited to get started. Thanks, Lisa. Next, we'll hear from John Kaloris, Blue Origin's Vice President for Lunar Transportation, who will be overseeing lander development and is joining us virtually. John? Good morning, everyone. Thank you again for this incredible opportunity. On behalf of Blue Origin and the national team, I want to thank NASA personally. Uh, we're very honored and humbled to be part of this incredible experience. Uh, we're looking forward to participating on Artemis V, and we're looking forward to working together. Uh, this national team has been working together for a number of years, and we're really maturing our efforts now, and uh, we're very excited about the Appendix P effort. The Blue Origin Blue Moon Lunar Lander is uh, configured in two configurations. The first configuration is a crew configuration that will be able to land four astronauts anywhere on the surface of the moon, day or night. That will be the first mission that we fly as part of Artemis V. This vehicle is also can be configured for a cargo landing mission able to carry up to 20 metric tons in a round trip a reusable configuration or 30 metric tons to the surface to form the foundation of habitats and other permanent infrastructure. Uh, as part of a national team, we're very fortunate to have Lockheed Martin, who is building the CIS Lunar Transporter. The CIS Lunar Transporter will provide refueling services from low Earth orbit to NRHO and the parking orbit of where our lander is located. Along with the team is Draper, who will be doing GNC navigation and also our training and simulation. We've also brought new members to the national team, Astrobotic, who will be doing our cargo accommodations, Honeybee Robotics, who will be doing our cargo offloading capability, and Boeing, who will be doing our docking systems. So uh, once again, thank you very much. We've been working very hard for this day and we're, very lo we're looking forward to working together. And we wanna also give thanks for uh, the incredible effort during Appendix H and how Appendix N and working together with NASA was able to get all, of, uh, all the competitors together and ready for Appendix P. Thank you. Thanks, John. So now it's time to answer your questions. We'll take both questions over the phones and here in the room. If you'd like to ask a question on the phone, just a reminder to please press one, star one, to get into the queue. 
Uh, first up, we have a question in the room from Joey Roulette with Reuters. Uh, thanks, um, and congrats to Blue Origin. What's the value of the contract, and how much money is Blue Origin putting into it? John? Uh, certainly. So um, the total valuated price will uh, come out. I will say that Blue Origin, our endeavors to make human permanence on the moon has uh, been part of our core beliefs for some time. So we want to establish permanence on the moon and we want to ensure that we have uh, consistent access to the moon. So with that in mind, uh, Blue Origin itself is contributing uh, over 50 percent of uh, the total effort to get to uh, not only this mission, but to ensure permanence. Can you, can you say how much the proposal was or what you think the award might be as far as value? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that question. John, he's asking how much the award was for. And I, our team can, Jim, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I mean, the, the uh, you'll see it in the uh, documentation that's released, but the award was about three and a half billion dollars, uh, the NASA award. Thanks. Thanks, Joey. Next up in the room, we have Jeff Faust with Space News. Uh, good morning. I'm um, wondering if anyone from NASA can say how many uh, bids it received for this, and what about the Blue Origin uh, proposal stood out that caused you to select it? Thank you. Uh, we evaluated uh, two proposals for the competition, and uh, uh, I, I would say the selection statement's going to come out here shortly. I encourage you to, to take a look at that uh, for the specifics, Jeff. Next, we'll take a question from the phone. So we have Irene Klotz with Aviation Week. Um, thanks. We can't hear any of the questions or the answers, by the way, so sorry if this is redundant, but could you say again the value of the award and what it covers as far as test flights? And also, if there was um, any, uh, how many uh, proposals did NASA review for the HLS sustaining work? Thank you. So I just want to check in with Brad, our operator, about the technical difficulties. I want to make sure our folks on the phone can hear. Um, the value of the award was $3.4 billion. And John said they're contributing about more than 50, 50, over 50%. 50, over 50 Brad, just want to double check, though. <laughs> Sorry that, that our folks can hear us. Okay. Um, next, we'll take a question from the room. Michael Sheets with CNBC. Thank you very much. I believe this question's best for NASA. Um, still on the contract value, I want to make sure I understand correctly because previously Blue Origin had said that they would be willing to fund up to $3 billion themselves. So am I understanding correctly that this is effectively a $6 billion combined development effort? And secondarily, is the Artemis V mission still planned uh, for 2029? Thank you. So. Yeah, so, so uh, it is, we're still planning five, uh, Artemis V for 2029, um, and, and the, the award was just over $3.4 billion, and I think it's, uh, it's Blue Origins, uh, kind of, they, they've given you the 50% number, they can, they can be more specific on the total dollar, dollar value amount. John, can you care to comment on that one? Yeah, hey Mike, um, so that's correct, uh, Blue Origin is, uh, is contributing uh, well north of $3.4 billion as part of this effort. Thank you very much. Thanks. We'll take our next question from the phones. Eric Berger with Ars Technica. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you very much for doing this, and congratulations on, on such a big day. Um, I guess my question is about NASA's budget priorities. You know, we saw a great flight of the SLS rocket. Um, late last year, and so that's that's getting to be flight proven, and, and now kind of a long pull on these lunar landings is the actual landers, and, and it seems like your budget for lunar landers is about the same as the the rocket over the next five years. And so I'm just wondering, you know, administrator or or, or, or Mr. Free, you know, do these budget priorities really reflect the urgency necessary in, in sort of getting getting to the lunar surface? Because you know the rocket's there, and then the lunar landers are, are are still have a long way to go. Thank you. Oh, 
both the Congress and the Office of Management and Budget have been very generous with us in making sure that we have the landers and that we have two landers. That has not been an easy task, but I want to give the shout out to both of them. They recognize that that's what is needed. Now, if I understand your question, is that provided in our budget? The answer is yes. And I think the announcement here today where uh, the successful bidder is putting in over 50% more skin in the game than what the NASA contract, fixed price contract is, is quite significant. And it underscores the fact that this public-private partnership, that we go back to the moon, uh, is in fact working. It's worked in the first uh, instance, as I said at the outset of my remarks, with SpaceX. And uh, they likewise put in a lot of skin in the game. And that uh, mission for the first lander is proceeding on schedule. Uh, and likewise, in the announcement of this award uh, today, you're seeing a similar uh, situation uh, that would uh, clearly indicate the wisdom of this public-private partnership. Thank you. We'll take our next question from here in the room. Uh, thank you. I'm Rock Oda for a Japanese national newspaper, Asahi Shimbun. Uh, I was wondering if you could provide the test schedule uh, for Blue Moon. Uh, when and how uh, do you plan to test it? Thank you. For John, would you mind elaborating on the testing schedule for the lander? Sure. Uh, thanks for the question. So uh, working backwards, if you will, at, before the first crew landing occurs, we will be landing a exact uh, copy of that lander prior to that, one year prior. So we'll be testing out full lander systems and the full architecture prior to any astronauts uh, entering the vehicle. And that will be roughly one year prior. Before that, we have a number of test launches and landings that we'll be, uh, we'll be releasing here soon. But as Lisa made reference, we do have our Blue Moon Mark I landers that uh, we are currently uh, posting uh, flight hardware for. You may have seen it on social media. And the team's very excited about working those to prove technologies for these future landers before crew members even step inside. Thanks, John. We'll take our next question from the phones. We have Alicia Sowers from Mashable. Hi, thank you. Um, this is a question for Mr. Kalors. Hopefully I will be able to hear his answer. Um, there have been three straight landing failures with um, the beret sheet and the Chandrian and now iSpace missions. All previous uh, private landers that I'm aware of have failed. And that's not a great track record. So. What makes you confident that you can achieve this, especially when there are humans involved? Thank you. Yes, thanks for the question. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Yes, I can hear you now. Thank you. Oh, great. Okay. So um, as I made reference to, we will be actually uh, landing a number of vehicles prior to uh, crew actually uh, uh, um, landing on the moon, utilizing our vehicles. So not only will we be testing the technologies in the lunar environment to ensure safety, uh, but then those will migrate into these landers. They will also fly, as I mentioned, a complete, uh, for the complete version of the lunar lander in a, an uncrewed fashion one year prior to check out all systems. We'll then launch a new lander for crew members to go on board. I'd also like to mention, um, that's one of the great things about the national team. Uh, Blue Origin has been working these landers for a number of years. Lockheed Martin brings extensive experience on landers as well as uh, their work on Orion. Draper, Astrobotic, and Honeybee are fantastic partners and they're part of the Eclipse Awards. Boeing as well with their experience on ISS and what they bring to the team. It's kind of like a perfect blending of what we're trying to do 
of lessons learned so we don't repeat those lessons again. Hey, and Jackie, can I add something to that, please? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I also want to add that there's also the NASA insight and the experience base that I mentioned in some of my earlier comments. And we're working towards human rating requirements. And, you know, as you saw from the Artemis One launch, we, we fully understand those. So working together collectively, we can bring the best from the government side and our years of experience with, with their experience, and, and we do believe it will be successful. Thank you very much. We'll take our next question from the phones. We have a, a Christopher Quiknos with Astronomy Magazine. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, this is, I guess, a question for John, um, maybe getting a little more specific about the test uh, schedule or sort of flow of tests. Um, is there the possibility or um, are you planning for a crewed uh, mission in Blue Moon that is Earth orbitable, Earth orbital um, before you actually um, do the crewed landing on the moon? Uh, thanks for your question. It's a great question. Um, the first time that crew members will enter the uh, lander will be when it's docked to Gateway. The crew members will um, go to Gateway via Orion and then transfer to a lander for operations between NRHO and the lunar surface and then back to Gateway. Okay, thank you. So, um, so that will actually be the Artemis V mission will be the first time crew are in it. That's correct. That's correct. And we have, as we okay, mentioned, all these you. demonstration missions prior to that, leading up to that mission. Great. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Certainly. Thank you both. Our next question on the phone is from Micah Maidenberg with Wall Street Journal. Hi there. Hey, John. Sorry if I missed this earlier, um, just with some of the technical issues, but um, how will Blue and its partners get you know, it's landers out to the moon for the, the test missions and later uh, to Gateway for Artemis V. Thanks. Certainly. So we utilize uh, our new Glenn uh, launch vehicle for all of our components, uh, both the lander to go to NRHO, as well as the cislunar transporter, and then uh, follow on refueling flights. Thank you both. Our next question on the phones is from Alan Boyle with GeekWire. Thank you. I had a couple of questions maybe to fill in some of the gaps in my understanding. I think, uh, I think it was mentioned that there would be a couple of Pathfinder flights. Uh, and so there's the one that happens a year before the crewed flight. And I think previously uh, Blue Origin had talked about how this was perhaps going to land in the vicinity of where the crewed landing might take place, and it might be possible to send some cargo that could be used during the crewed mission. Uh, so that's, that's one issue that I wanted to find out is whether that was still the plan. And then are there other Pathfinder flights that would be flown before that uncrewed uh, lunar landing, or are you referring perhaps to a SpaceX Pathfinder flight, for example? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your question, Alan. So, um, and it, this will come out as part of uh, the award, but Blue Origin will be landing uh, two landers prior to the Mark II lander that will demonstrate single string operations, avionics, BE-7, reaction control system, et cetera, uh, to this, uh, right now south pole of the moon. Then uh, after those two missions, we'll fly the first uncrewed uh, mission as part of this award in Appendix P, and return that to NRHO. That goes, and that's, that's worth noting because right now that's above and beyond the uh, Appendix P requirements of just landing. We're actually are going to uh, lift off and bring it back to NRHO. And then we'll launch a new lander that will then carry crew to the surface. Thank you. Our next question on the phones is from Bill Harwood with CBS News. Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, John, can you give us uh, any ballpark on the mass of the lander, the Mark II lander that's going to carry astronauts, uh, just, just to give us a sense of that, and any dimensions you might have off the top of your head uh, to ballpark it? And out of curiosity, what's going to happen to the unpiloted lander, that you, the full-up lander that you test before the astronauts come? Is that simply discarded, or is it in some way can it be used again? Thanks. Sure, great question. Thanks. I'll, I'll work backwards. 
um, the first lander could be utilized again. Uh, we're right now using that as purely risk reduction so that our uh, efforts are not dependent on that lander, but it could absolutely be uh, utilized a second time. Uh, the lander is optimized for our seven meter fairing of New Glen. So we specifically optimize um, height and mass for uh, New Glen. Um, and then mass uh, will be part of the release when we get into that because uh, it depends, of course, on which mission and so forth. Um, the, the important points, as you can see here in the graphic, because this is now a sustainable lander, uh, the Appendix P requirements allowed us to look back at the original Appendix H and say, OK, if we want to re if we want to emphasize robust, reliable, low cost operations, what would how would we structure that lander? And it was an integrated lander. And as you can see, it's an integrated lander that now allows crew access to the surface, um, not only uh, rapid access to the surface, but then also scales for future efforts such as a lunar terrain vehicle or habitats where perhaps those could dock directly to the lander crew module and not require an EVA to transfer from the vehicle to uh, one of these uh, permanently in place uh, assets. So that's why we're, we're proud of this lander. And uh, as you can see, it's an integrated lander um, so that the entire system can be reused and then land again in a different location in the moon. Thanks, John. Our next question on the phone comes from Leo Enright with Irish TV. Uh, thanks very much for doing this. I, I guess this is probably for the administrator. I was just wondering, you mentioned uh, ace for e, the European Space Agency's refueling uh, communications module is going up on this flight. Uh, do you envisage a European astronaut going uh, on this mission? And do you envisage that European astronaut walking on the moon. You're way ahead <laughs> with that question. Uh, the Canadian astronaut is going on Artemis II. Uh, on Artemis III, which is the first landing of the four crew members, two will descend to the surface. Uh, we expect that will be the first woman and the next man to land on the moon. Now, obviously, that crew has not been selected. The crew that's been selected is the one that's in D.C. right now, uh, by the way, to rave reviews uh, as uh, the crew of Artemis II, which will circle the moon. So when will foreign astronauts join on the actual landing? That's much further down the road, uh, but uh, likely it would not be on Artemis III on the first landing. Uh, that is expected. The first woman and the first man would both be Americans. Thank you. Our next question on the phones is from David Denault with About Space Today. Good morning. My question uh, deals with the Gateway, and to help people understand this, and, and John, I think you made that kind of clear on your lander, that um, these could be reusable, uh, unlike the limb, which would separate and leave a portion on the ground. So the question here is, how do you get, uh, are you going to use your Glenn rocket to get these landers to Gateway on a regular basis? So people understand that these are just, if it, it could be reused, well, how do we refuel, for example? And what are the differences between the SpaceX lander and Blue Horizon? Sure, that's, a, again, another uh, excellent question. So. First of all, the landers are designed to remain in NRHO, so to remain in a uh, uh, similar orbit to Gateway. So uh, they're not going back and forth from LEO, so they just require uh, refueling. That's what the Cislunar Transporter from Lockheed Martin provides. So in low Earth orbit, we refuel that vehicle from New Glenn. Once that's refueled, it transits to NRHO and it docks and refuels the, uh, the Blue Moon uh, land, lunar lander. Once refueling is complete, 
it can actually stay docked and provide services to the lander for quite some time. Um, or it can then uh, undock and we would then continue to uh, gateway with the lander to, uh, to dock. Did that answer all of your questions? Well, I wanted to compare the lander to SpaceX's lander. Are they similar? Um, I'm actually uncertain about the complete con op on SpaceX, but I will say that ours refuels, and again, the payload is a different payload, uh, different payload capacity. But ours refuels in, uh, our assist lander transporter refuels in LEO and then goes to NRHO to refuel the lander. But the lander does stay in the lunar environment. It does not transit back and forth. So how many landers will you have to have to complete this long-term mission? One lander is capable of multiple years and multiple missions. In fact, we uh, worked that in, in, uh, expressly for this proposal to provide uh, large margins above the NASA requirements, as well as be able to perform multiple missions. Thanks, John. We'll take our next question from here in the room. Joey Roulette with Reuters. Thanks, Jackie. A uh, question for John. Um, Blue Origin really fought hard to, to get to this point. Um, how does it feel uh, being here, and how would you kind of char characterize the journey um, in the past few years to, to get this contract? Thanks. That is a, a fantastic question. It's um, We've got a strong group of very motivated, very uh, humble yet proud people and we worked very hard on appendix h uh and uh we learned so much from that and so much from the nasa collaboration that that allowed us to enter appendix n revisit our entire configuration and our architecture and be successful today for appendix p so i can tell you the feeling is absolutely fantastic i'm, I'm proud and uh i'm proud of this team across the entire national team uh, this is step one, though. We have a lot to do uh, before we successfully land and return astronauts. And we're, we're really, uh, we've been working for some time and we're still ready to go. Thanks, John. We're going to take another question from here in the room. Michael Sheets with CNBC. Thank you so much. For the folks on the stage here, uh, two questions about the other bids. How many bids did you receive in total from different teams? As it, obviously there were group efforts here going on underway. So well, how many other bids? Because we know about the Dynetics bid. And on the Dynetics bid, have they given you any indication that they're going to continue development themselves? Or is this you know, something where they needed the development funding from you guys to really put more effort in seriously? Thank you. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, we evaluated two proposals, uh, and and you can, as mentioned, review those in the source selection statement. And as uh, regards to their plans, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, we these notified both folks yesterday afternoon, so uh, I, I wouldn't know their their future plans. Thanks, Jim. Our next question on the phones is from Ken Chang with the New York Times. Ken? Uh, it's Ken, can you hear us? If not, our next one on the phone is uh, David Curley with Discovery Channel. Unless we lost the phones. All right, we'll take one in the room here. Jeff Faust with Space News. Yeah, question uh, for John. I know one of the big challenges for your architecture is uh, being able to maintain the uh, liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen propellants for extended periods of time. Um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the technologies you're investing in to be able to uh, achieve that and what the status of that is. Is that being funded by this award or that work that uh, is already ongoing? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for your question. So this is, again, one of these um, great examples of the public-private partnership that we have with NASA. Uh, first of all, we've been funding our zero boil-off uh, effort for some time within Blue Origin, uh, as well as our partners in the national team. And we want to make hydrogen a storable propellant. 
because we believe that not only does that open permanency on the moon, but also enables the rest of the solar system via other technologies, such as nuclear thermal propulsion. If you can make hydrogen storable, then you can do a number of things. And if the ability to eventually utilize lunar resources allow us to extract propellants, we'll want to store those. So we've been working very hard internally. We also have a number of tipping points, not only on zero boil off, but also how are you going to transfer these propellants? The couplers, the pumps, how do you transfer from vehicle to vehicle um, so far from Earth? So again, uh, we've been working quite some time on this. We're very, uh, we've been doing quite well on our zero, zero Kelvin, uh, zero boil off system. Uh, excuse me, our 20 Kelvin uh, zero boil off system. Um, but I just want to reiterate the partnership with NASA has been critically important in order to get that uh, as far as it has so far. Uh, our next question, we're going to try the phones again, is from Ken Chang with the New York Times. Ken, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Hello? Yep. Great. Uh, so the two questions for John Kloris. Uh One, is the name of the lander officially Blue Moon? And two, do you have plans for any commercial non-NASA missions using the system? Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks for your question. So it is the Blue Moon Lunar Lander. Um, internally, we have uh, version numbers, but the Blue Moon Lunar Lander is the uh, is the name of the vehicle. And we do have a number of uh, commercial entities that are interested. So um, kind of like to the previous question, not only NASA and Blue Origin and the national team, but there are other customers that are uh, looking to uh, utilize the capability that we're offering. So we would offer both uh, just in in the spirit of commercial uh, space, we'd offer both uh, external as well as uh, internal opportunities. Thanks, John. Great, we have thank a, you. We have another question from the phones. David Curley with the Discovery Channel. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, John, you talked about uh, 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 designing this uh, spacecraft to go with New Glenn. Can you give us a sense of what Blue Origin is thinking is its role in Artemis in 2030, 2035, overall, big picture? Uh, sure, so our role in Artemis, uh, we're very excited about this lander design, as we said, not only to enable um, four astronauts for over 30 days of stay time, but as, as I mentioned, uh, some of the design points that it will grow and fit with a permanent presence, whether that be with vehicles, with habitats. And so we wanna support that. And that's why uh, you may have seen in some of our social media posts, we're already working uh, day night capability, any location on the moon so that we can operate as new discoveries are made and grow with NASA in the 2030s and beyond. Um, but also our cargo lander. Uh, the fact that we can carry up to 20 metric tons uh, in a reusable configuration and up to 30 metric tons in a one way configuration allows ourselves, allows NASA, allows the international world to make discoveries on the moon and adapt to where we may want to put those assets. So that's what we're thinking. And that's also why we look to exceed the requirements in the Appendix P uh, solicitation so that our as we make new discoveries, as we learn new things, that this lander can support growth if it's needed. Thanks, John. Our next question on the phones is from Tim Fernholz with Quartz. Hi there. Um, question for John. Uh, I understand that there's a, a bit of technology development that has to be done for the propellants of the LOX LH2 uh, around its temperature um, and the need to keep it cool in space. Can you talk about how you're going to buy down risk and what is novel uh, about the propulsion system here? Yeah, certainly. Um, again, great question. So Blue Origin, uh, as, as I mentioned, we're a firm believer in the utilization of hydrogen as being uh, a core, extremely um, efficient uh, propellant combination for not only lunar exploration for beyond. So even since that time, since we started, we've been looking at uh, how do we utilize hydrogen? How do we gain experience? Our BE-7 engine, which we have on test stand, uh, 116 at Marshall Space Flight Center has been firing off a number of times doing quite well. We've accumulated a lot of time on that engine. Uh, zero boil off. So again, being able to store that propellant in space 
that's going that is an important uh, effort. It's got a lot of our attention on it, but it's to make hydrogen and oxygen a storable uh, a storable propellant. And so we're working, you know, we work, we're building uh, cryo coolers right now. I don't want to go too much into technology, but we are building that hardware. We're building hardware specifically for the high RPMs that are required in order to keep uh, these propellants stored permanently. And that's what we've been testing, not only on the ground, but then we'll be working with NASA part with our NASA partnership on their test stands and then continue testing on orbit. Thanks, John. Our next question on the phone comes from Stephen Clark with Spaceflight Now. Thank you. I think a couple of questions for, for John, if I could. Uh, the, if you could pull up the uh, artist illustration and kind of walk us through the different elements of uh, the lander from top to bottom. And uh, earlier someone asked about the height of the lander from landing legs to the top. Uh, if you have that number available, that would be great. Uh, if you could walk through that for us, please, thanks. Sure. So as I mentioned, uh, maybe if you can bring the graphic up, the lander itself is designed to fit in the seven meter diameter uh, fairing of New Glenn. Uh, it's 16 meters tall and its dry mass is uh, 16 metric tons uh, with propellant. We're uh, north of 45 uh, metric tons. Uh, going from the top down, it's a little cut off, but on the upper deck are high gain antennas. Uh, we actually exceed NASA requirements for high gain communications coverage. Uh, to uh, not only to Earth, but via relay services. Uh, working from top to bottom, the large tank is our liquid hydrogen tank that's um, behind those uh, the two uh, panels that you see there. Those are uh, thermal radiators. On the back side of the vehicle facing the sun is the solar array. Uh, right below that is our liquid oxygen tank. And then right below that is the crew module that's capable of carrying fruit, uh, four crew members with an airlock and with uh, immediate surface access. You can see to the left of the, uh, of the uh, two large windows there is the docking adapter. And that's the docking adapter that can be uh, utilized for gate or would be used uh, for gateway operations. Thanks, John. Our next question on the phones is from Zach Aubert with the Launchpad News. Yeah, thank you, Zach Aubert, TLB Network Launchpad News. First, congratulations. Uh, to Blue Origin. For John, can Blue Moon go directly from LEO to NRHL and then land crew on the moon in one go, or will it require refueling from a tug before the first landing? And how much lead time does Blue need to be able to build a Blue Moon lander to be ready uh, for another mission? And then for NASA, following Artemis 5, how are you going to select which lander is selected for each mission? Are we thinking a rotational system, or what are the thoughts there? Thank you. John, do you want to start sure. First? So, yeah, starting off, uh, the Blue Moon lander is capable of going from LEO to NRHO. However, it would then have to be refueled again to go from NRHO to the uh, surface of the moon. And the reason for that is we don't want to carry all that additional structure and mass that's required to do that entire trip. It's not part of the requirement, especially since we're leaving the, uh, the lander in NRHO in the proximity of the moon. Um, your second question, I'm sorry, I can't recall right now. Oh, how long lead time for the lander? Um, right now, we are we are building um, qualify or excuse me test components of our tanks, and uh, we fully expect to meet the NASA uh, schedule uh, for both vehicles. So both the first uncrewed demonstration uh, Blue Moon lander, and then the crewed demo land. Uh, excuse me, the crewed lunar lander. Thanks, John. Jim, do you want to say something? Yeah, and, and our, so our acquisition planning for Artemis 6 and out is just getting underway. Obviously, we'll take advantage of uh, technologies and systems that have already been developed, but uh, we're just at the forefront of uh, for Artemis 6 and beyond. Thank you. And we have a question on the phones from Ken Kramer with Space Up Close. Uh, thank you. Thanks for doing this. Uh, let me ask. Uh, the NASA folks a question. Can you talk about the uh, the Artemis 3 and Artemis 4 missions a little more? How how, how long will each of those be since Artemis 5 is going to be uh, th uh, for 30 days? And do you plan on landing all of these at the same site or will they be different landing sites at the South Pole? Thanks. 
So mission durations for, for three, four, and five, actually those uh, are, are probably be short duration, the three and four definitely be short duration missions. I expect five will probably be as well. Um, but of course, we're looking at each of those missions as, uh, um, as we go along. As to where we'll land them, uh, you know, we've, we've just, we announced, not just, uh, announced uh, last year the 13 landing regions that we're looking at for three. We'll uh, look mission by mission of where we want to go with science as our highest priority. Um, so, so right now we're focused on where we're going to land uh, uh, that final uh, landing site within one of those landing regions for three right now is in the evaluation process. And uh, the science team has ideas of where they'd like to go uh, at the poles um, for future missions beyond that. But right now we're just focused on selecting for three. Thanks. I think we'll try and take one more. Our last question is from Bill Harwood with CBS News. Hey, thanks a lot for coming back to me. Just a real quick one for John. Uh, you know, as someone who's covered space for a number of years, I mean, things do break. I mean, can you talk about what capability astronauts might have to make repairs on this vehicle in, in, in lunar orbit? I mean, you know, I assume you've got systems that are replaceable or, or could be repaired, but uh, if you're going to use it long term, obviously you have to have some way to do maintenance. I'm just wondering if you can talk about that in general terms. Thanks. Yeah, great question. And that's one of the uh, key uh, factors that went into our design to build for maintainability, to build for reuse and to build for that robustness, especially as we uh, learn new lessons. So um, first of all, the NASA requirements are great. Lisa made reference to the design and construction standards. What we have to do to support astronauts uh, on this vehicle is very helpful in guiding a lot of this. But then there are things such as line replaceable units. Are they in easy access? Are they within the pressurized or unpressurized volume? There's, um, without getting into too much, uh, but like robotic inspection of engines and that kind of thing. So that's what we'll be working for uh, through during this uh, process. Uh, we already have some ideas on that. And uh, as we go into our preliminary design review and our critical design review, that will not only be an important aspect, but we will utilize that very first uncrewed lander to test some of that, to see what we can do from the ground before we even um, bring an astronaut in the loop. And that's just for things like line replaceable units. Within the vehicle itself, there's levels of redundancy. There's also the ability for the vehicle itself to fault detect, isolate, and recover from any faults. And then the ability from the, from the ground to also uh, update any faults. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. That's unfortunately all we have time for today. I'd like to hand it over to Administrator Nelson to close this out. So let's put all this discussion in context. We're going back to the moon in order for us to go to Mars and beyond. That's what Colonel Pam Melroy and Colonel Bob Cabana have been explaining in a detailed moon to Mars architecture. This is a major part of it. We go to the moon and it is hard, but when we go to Mars, it's going to be harder. So we go to the moon to learn, to live, to invent, to create all these things to be successful on the moon, to go to Mars. The great adventure of humankind pressing out into the cosmos is here. And this is a part of it. So thank you for joining us today. Have a good day.